Hello there, friends. Welcome to another episode of our weekly Bible study podcast. I'm Scott Wakefield, lead pastor at First Christian Church of Greene County, Tennessee, joined as always by Tyson Hodge at the Greenville campus. That's funny. Uh, that's great. I wonder if the camera actually switched over to me while oh. you said that. <laughs> That'd be great. It needs to have a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should have been mouthing it. Right. Uh, so Tyson was upset because we always go over here to this side. To he was feeling first, he was right. feeling left out. No, yeah. I just knew. We the do pattern. typically go this way. It's okay. Mix up the pattern. You're a funny guy. Of course guy, you Tyson. were. Of course Who you were. Who are you? I'm Tommy. Hey, Tommy. Afton campus pastor. Here so uh, we're in First John for the first time in First John, First John three through five. This series is called Love the Father Has Given, and uh, we're going to start in two twenty eight, not three one. And not 229, as some begin that section. We're going to start in 228 uh, because that's where it introduces the idea of being God's little child. But then in 3, 1 and following, it talks about how God loves his children. Sounds, sounds reasonable. I mean, I'll go along with it. The paragraph in my Bible has it that way. So yes. I... <laughs> but the reason I say all that is because our mixer is uh, this question related to all that. Um, how do you pronounce the word B-E-L-O-V-E-D? B-E-L-O-V-E-D. Yeah, normally I just say um, beloved. <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> of course Tyson thinks that's hilarious because you surprised him with craziness. That's right. Uh. That's right. <laughs> I, truthfully, I've never heard anyone say beloved. Oh, no? Really? Oh, I wow. have. Oh. Well, I yeah. can't say never. That's it's just very common. my brain says that's 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 wrong. So so you beloved just your answer feels, is beloved. Yeah, but at the same time, I never use the word also unless I'm reading it from scripture. I never call someone my beloved. I you never don't, say you don't, thus and you that don't say is when you my do beloved. Wedding, Bethany, you're dearly my beloved. beloved. No, I don't say that. None of I us say says that to my, our wives, probably. You're my sugar honey bunch of oats. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I was Right on the cusp of saying utterly ridiculous, but that quickly switched to awesome. Uh, do you say beloved or sugar honey bunches of oats to whatever you To said? Leslie? To Leslie. Probably not. It's, a, it's not a word that is normally used uh, except for more formal occasions. I don't even think I have it. I don't say it in the wedding scripts um, unless someone specifically. Dearly beloved. Re- yeah, unless someone like the beginning of the Prince song requested it, I wouldn't say it. But I say beloved. I think I say beloved now. But I think I used to say beloved. I think I tried to once because I was, um, I didn't want to, you know, you don't want to give in to just the way that people say it. But <laughs> you don't, I mean, you don't want to give in to the conventional way people actually talk. Well, I didn't want to you sound old want fashioned. To, I think you don't want to make language easy. No. <laughs> so then when you don't know what to say, you just make it so ridiculously wrong. Which you did earlier. Which I did. Yes. Uh huh, and you just break that ice with humor. Would you say beloved? I, who, you no one knows. He doesn't even know. He can't. He can't <laughs> beloved. repeat it now. Beloved. <laughs> beloved. This is painful. Yeah, I right. said it with the bell. Thanks bail. for joining us. Yeah. Catch you next time. That's wow. what first. That's how you do John it. two twenty eight through three ten means. Yeah. All right. So, uh, beloved, beloved, um, which is used as a title here, which is cool. Um, the way I say it is, I think beloved. Okay. Do you? No, you do not. I think I have. Typically said beloved. And we're going to pull some film up. <laughs> and I think I probably have said beloved here and there, too. I, if if lately, Wes can do but, that, that would be amazing. Uh, if we can insert some different... Uh, right. That'll be clips, well worth his time of to research it to all of that. Yeah. Maybe AI well, can that is do not that. Worth, can we submit our videos that to AI? That is not worth the time. That is not worth the time. No, Let's not. talk about Jesus. All right. Let's so, do that. So um, somebody read 1 John 2.28 through 3.10 fairly rapidly, please. I'll go fast. Sounds good. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we might have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, then... If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children. Now and what we will be has not yet appeared. 
but what but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness sin is lawlessness you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin no one who abides in him keeps on sinning no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him little children let no one deceive you Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother." Thank you, thank you. When I try and read fast, I, I stumble on words, so I may have messed that up. That's quite all right. Yeah. You did. It's ruined. Yeah, sorry. You said might instead of may. and Beloved, bell o I mean, yeah. I just, yeah. All righty, so uh, some intro and orientation to the entire book of 1 John, just to get into it a little bit, give us some context. Written by the Apostle John, very late in uh, terms of the canon, uh, probably 90 to 95. Uh, probably to the church of Ephesus, but it's not a letter to them in the same sense as Paul's epistles as we typically think of it. It's probably a... And by this time, they were circulating these kinds of letters among churches commonly, which they did for many of the others, but mm. it was a known thing by then. So... did Is there uh, any thought on its relevance to when he was writing Revelation? Was he on Patmos? When he was writing First, Second, uh, Third John, no, before, after, um, did he ever get off? I the think island? it's after. After, okay. Yeah, after when? After, after. Mm. Um, I don't karate, know. Karate Kid. So let's see. Uh, historical situation, reason for writing, what's going on. Um, used to be typically thought because of. Dagon Rudolf Bultmann. Um, you, guys, that, you guys remember him? <laughs> uh, he was demyth- demythologizing everything. So it used to be thought that 1 John was written against the people who were from within the church believing the Gnostics or the proto-Gnostics, the early Gnostics. Those who believed in a secret form of knowledge that like only the cool special people get, not normal folks, just the cool special people. And that anybody who doesn't have that secret knowledge isn't actually like, isn't really a a Jesus follower. Um, There are some other things related to all that like. Kind of sounds like a, a, a version of Scientology that includes Jesus. Scientology has a lot of that secret knowledge you have mm. to gain. Yes, yes. Uh, idea. Um, there is the one of the things that makes Gnosticism a heresy is that the um, knowledge comes from inside of you, um, and so that it's and divi- not from not from God, an external source. True that God, is, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like a. Um, almost like God left his DNA inside of us and we just got to, like, it comes from in you. Um, so there's a divine light is what it's called. But like, and, and that's why um, Jesus only seemed to or looked like he was human uh, and doing the things that the Bible claims he does. Um, yeah. Because yeah. if he was actually flesh and did those things as an objective reality that achieved salvation for us, that would be what we believe, and that's not what they believe, which is what you just said. Because they also rejected any goodness in, in, in material, right? Am I remembering correctly? Yeah, mm-hmm. that is definitely a Gnostic thing. So yep. then they would, mm-hmm. that would be another reason it's why they're totally rejecting. It's totally flatly spiritual, yeah. entirely. Right. right. So then the flesh Jesus, the body, yes. human Jesus was, was an illusion. Yes. Exactly. Docetics believe that. Okay. So that's what they typically thought John was talking, against, uh, writing against. Mm-hmm. But having said all that. We don't think it is. <laughs> having said all that, more and more, uh, we don't think it was probably that much against the Gnostics or proto-Gnostics. Uh, and it's probably just trying to correct those kinds of things um, as they were brewing in the culture. 
um, in a positive way and not a polemical negative way. There's more to say to all that, but. No, that's helpful. Um, I think that's that's really helpful because I'm glad you think it so, helps us I didn't frame, like it especially as we're focusing in, because I was, you know, or answering the question, why are we jumping in here part way? Because yeah. we're wanting to see what is um, John teaching us about love in particular. In yes. particular. Mm-hmm. And that is not a, a negative response of something. It is a positive affirmation of this is the way a Christian loves. Mm-hmm. Um, so not, not a negative type of a yeah. thing. Yeah. One thing that's hard about First John, uh, before we jump in, is that Paul is making an argument. You follow along. He's making a pretty logical, linear argument. Um, or lots of historical narrative is chronological. You can just kind of follow. Are you going to say that John has ADD? I'm going to say that John has ADD, and he jumps all over the place. Let's and cancel you're not Scott. sure, and you're... <laughs> canceled. I knew he was going to say it. Uh, so it's not easily followed. It's like all yeah. over the place, pastiche, and he circles back Ooh. to things. Is, is that French? Pastiche is a... Uh, just, just move on. Um, <laughs> so Gold. he's circling back around to certain themes yeah, um, and expanding those later on. But yeah. Mm-hmm. So. All right. There we go. Main themes. God is light. God is love. Christ was actually a, a real person and actually did things. Mm-hmm. Um, My ESV study Bible has a key themes page on it. Ooh, tell I us. I always make the arguments to get this Bible. They're very good. Yeah. yeah. Tell, us, tell us more about it. Um, that the eternal God, it has key themes. It lists six of them. Uh, the one eternal God became incarnate in his son, Jesus Christ, who is the true God in eternal life. That's in chapter one, four, and five. All humans are sinful, but Christians have joyful fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with each other through the repentance of faith in Christ. That's chapter one. Christ is our advocate with the Father and the propitiation for our sins. That's chapter two and chapter four. Those who know Christ forsake sin and keep God's commandments, in particular, the love commandment. And that's a big thing for what we're talking about here. It's a big thing, chapter 2, 3, and 4. Yep, Yep. that's why we're doing 3 through 5. It's a little bit in 2, but yeah. Mm -hmm. The the number 5, the denial of Jesus Christ as God's Son in the flesh is the denial of God the Father. And so there we have a little hint of the Gnosticism stuff, perhaps. Um, That's chapter 2, 4, and 5. And then the last one, faith in Christ results in forgiveness of sins, eternal life, confidence in prayer, protection from the evil one, and understanding and knowing the true God, chapter 5. And to jump into our passage at long last. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, when you read number four, yeah, uh, those who know Christ forsake sin and keep God's commandments, in particular the love commandment, he starts making that argument um, at the end of the second chapter by talking about how they're God's children uh, because they've been made new, they have a new heart, they've been regenerated. And if you're God's child and you've been regenerated, then you love. Mm-hmm. You love like you've been loved is, is the heart of all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's start there, 228, which you so capably read quickly, thank you. I mean, it was, it was, it was average. It's truly amazing. Um, and now, little children, Abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. So why is John calling them little children? Why is he telling them to abide in Christ so that they may have confidence, not shrink in shame? Um, He's calling them little children because he is writing to them as a spiritual father, as a spiritual mature uh, leader. Sure. And so he's encouraging them in their growth, in their walk, in their maturity. And mm-hmm. so that's what children do. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, and now little children abide in him, which uh, he's, already, he's already told them this. He's already alluded to this. This is him circling back at, on, one, one of, on one of his ADHD moments. Back here in chapter well, so he two. added the H well said, to that. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Back yeah. <laughs> over here on uh, <laughs> chapter two, <clears throat> he said, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way mm. in which he walked. Yeah. And so he's saying here, 
walk like Jesus. Yeah. Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame. What would that shame be? It, it would be the fact that they're not walking like him. They're not um, being true disciples, trying to be like Christ. I'm not adding to that. That was good. Thank okay. you. So uh, 28 and 29 are circling back to some themes to say, hey, your gods, your little children, you don't have to be freaking out about these people who left. The people who left them who said, you guys are all wrong and dumb. Um, which is why he's saying, if you're practicing righteousness, if you are loving as you've been loved, if you're practicing righteousness in any way that is like the righteousness you've been given in Jesus, what you were saying, mm -hmm. uh, then you are, then you're legitimate. You don't have to, you don't have to be freaking out. You can have assurance mm -hmm. because you're the real thing. In fact, 3-1 and following, look at, see what kind of love the Father's given that we should be called children. It's an interesting way to say it there, but in 3-1, um, that, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> where it says, see what kind of love the Father's given to us, mm -hmm. that, that is not a purpose, that. It's not so that we should be called children of God as much as it is a, um, I can't remember the term. I'll have to look this up, but there's a term for this, the, the kind of clause that that is that says, um, how amazing is it that even we should be called his children? That's how great the love of the Father is. It's a way to say, here's the love. How great is that love in this way? Yeah, and, and the fact that he's saying the Father has done this work. Right. You can be assurance that you, you can be assured that you're children of God because of what he has done. That's right. Not because of things you have or have not. Mm -hmm. I have twice now as we've seen this word children, I just keep thinking back to the way that Jesus said, don't keep the children from coming. And so this mm -hmm. idea of not um, shrinking away in shame um, and how we are called children of God, um, Jesus welcomed um, so warmly those who were children of God. And in part, as we teach through that, we recognize that children come um, with uh, this sense of faith and awe and wonder that a lot of times our hardened sense of adulthood mm -hmm. uh, can squash out. And so I love the idea of being called back to a mind of children who comes and approaches the Father, uh, who demonstrates his heart of love, um, and then I can approach uh, through the work uh, of Christ. Um, so it just brings me back towards um, thinking, about, thinking about that when I would very easily shrink in shame, mm -hmm. uh, mindful of my... Um, my own worth or lack of worth, in fact. Sure, and also another layer to uh, complement that is children come to their parents just assuming and expecting the parents to, to do the work of taking care of them, to provide for them. And, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, an assumption, of course, because yeah. you know nothing different. I mean, the, that's my, a, my kids just walk up like, give me food. Be. Right, right, right. Just, like, it's your job, give me food. <laughs> they just have And you have to teach them to be grateful and say, please. <laughs> sure, yeah, right. <laughs> it's that bad in that sense. Right, right. Yeah. But, but, but that points to their just inward knowledge. Like, um, it's a given. Yeah, it's a given. My parents are going to do the things that I need. Yeah, and so we are. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what he mm -hmm. means there. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's that much of a given. Uh, the word I was looking for earlier was apposition. Uh, <laughs> it's a hint of clause, the so that, that, that often is a purpose thing, but in the context, that that, sorry to go nerdy, that that is in apposition to such love, uh, which is the beginning of 3-1. What kind of love? Such love the Father has given. So it's brought close to and compared with such love. Um, so it's just a way of expressing, like, the content of God's love is so great that we are his children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, I love the reassurance there at the end of that, uh, so we are. 
And then it just tails right off of that, the next sentence. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him, which it just yes. how often, I mean, obviously it speaks to the felt need there of I don't feel like the world understands. I don't, there's, there's, there's this tension uh, with who I am and what I, where I fit within the world's systems and the world's ways. And so as I contrast the way the world thinks, operates, um, I feel lost. And so there's this reassurance that, no, 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 even though you don't always feel or might feel the friction or the tension, um, we are indeed children of God. In fact, verse 2, beloved, kind of used as a title there, right? Um, We are God's children now. And that means a lot of things. If we know God, unlike the world, as you just said, we're his children, as we've already established. And then he goes into this section that's in some ways kind of extended throughout, not explicit all the way, but it is talked about, that says what we will be has not yet appeared. Okay, so we're beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. It's like a now and not yet thought. The glorification, right, right. Like we're children now, but we will really become glorified, full-fledged children to come, the resurrected, glorified bodies. Is is that what you're saying? But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Yeah, right. We shall see him as he is, fullness, in the fullness, as you just said. Jesus has that template of what we are to become. The right. second coming um, is what this is pointing towards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's a fullness that's even greater than we'd experience now, which is the hope that's rooted in what we already have and not a hope that's just a, uh, a generic desire for something. Um, so the hope of the future, which is even better than now, is assurance for now which is what he'll get to here is the point. Um, so it's kind of a funny way to say it, but it's going to be even better then, which means you need to recognize how much you already have now. Um, we're already God's children. We know him. Through Christ we have um, more than we realize when we love or we do anything that is like the love we've received. This is a way of saying that a lot of times in a, the mindset of a Christian, uh, we think about um, what we don't yet have. So we're just waiting around until heaven. And it makes it less practical for the way we're living right now. And right. one of the things that John is going to teach us is the way that we're living right now is impacted with the, those realities. So uh, the now and not yet is, is both. We don't just um, kind of hang out with our ticket to heaven that we one day are going to cash in, and then we're just kind of sitting around on poof, pool floats like uh, here waiting for that moment that there is a practical reality of how it changes even the right now um, in what we're doing pool floats i mean we could talk about wally you know like the also just kind of zooming around the that's the mind the fire extinguisher uh, how they float around fat uh, oh in the outer space yeah yeah Yeah, there's this idle mindset of okay well i'm just going to kind of hang out and do nothing um, that goes on because one day I'll actually do things. I think a lot of Christians really do get stuck in this, like, just sit around and do nothing. That the point of salvation is for future. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not effect or necessarily mean meaningful now all that much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, he's about to get into it. He's about to tell us how this works out practically. How does it work out practically? Well, I don't versus know, something about sin. <laughs> Verses 4 through, uh, let's say, well, really the end, frankly. 4 through the end is this, the verification of being real is that you're not making a practice of sinning. And the practice part, the practice of sinning is important to to highlight because it's not just, oh, you sin at all or you don't sin at all. Um, It's the heart that continues to want and desire to do the sin or not um, can be evidence of being born of God with a regenerate heart and being his child or not. And that's, that's another big central theme here is of whom are you born? God, the devil, 
uh, are you a child of God? Are you a child of the evil one? Um, if you love in the way that we've been loved, which is, you know, God's grace, love, of course, uh, if you love like that or you don't, those are kind of the contrasts there. Mm -hmm. As I was reading through this earlier and sitting across from Tommy in our office, um, it, it kind of, I, I shared this thought with him and we went back and forth a little bit, but this thought that Jesus came to take away our sins, but also to take away our, our sinning. Mm. Um, and I was... As a practice. Right. Not was, that there isn't any sin at all. So we were going right. back and forth, and, and, and uh, he was helping me clarify some, some, uh, some of these words. Uh, Jesus took away our sins in the, fact, in the sense of, like, our guilt. Um, and a lot of people stop there. And a lot of people think, okay, that's the point of sin. I now have, have, have guilt-free, a guilt-free life. Therefore, I can go sin some more. Uh, but Jesus also came to take away our sinning, the practice thereof. Uh, not just the guilt, but also the, the practice. And, of course, that is a, a lifelong sanctification right. practice. You're not saying perfection in that sense, of course. But no. and I think Some Christians even, do, even based on this passage and some things in mm -hmm. First John. Sure, I'm not right. saying that. I know you're not. Yeah. And even, and even John like is that. saying here yeah. that we will one day be like Christ, totally righteous and sinless mm -hmm. at his coming. Right. And not yet. Which is why we can continue to make progress in holiness and doing that is further evidence of all of that. And this is what I was saying when I was talking about how it, we have this idea that my guilt's taken care of so then one day I'll cash in my ticket in heaven. Yeah. That um, it impacts our daily living and I think that I didn't just, I was realizing I was confirmed by the ESV in the study notes there as I was reading through some of those it says in the study note for this 4 through 10, to confess the Son and to have the Father profoundly alters daily living. And there are a lot of Christians who don't think about how our faith impacts our life day to day. And when they miss that, they miss this idea that as you were talking about the difference between sin, sinning, they miss this idea that there is this uh, daily walk with the Lord where he is sanctifying us and he is saving us from this practice that we knew in our sinful flesh, that he is saying, uh, making us um, walk in a different way. And we were, as we were talking about this, we were talking about just how different my life, I was reflecting back over the years of my walk of faithfulness, looks uh, because of my continual submission uh, to Scripture and to God's shaping of my life. And I think that's the idea that, unfortunately, a lot of Christians can get into the wrong habit of just showing up once a week or maybe once every few weeks to church and um, not um, submitting on a daily basis. And they wonder, hey, I, I'm a quote unquote Christian, but my life doesn't look any different. And I would say John, even in, within First John says, it can be every single week. In fact, it can be a bunch of times a week and you can still not actually. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. No, if you go to church more, it makes you better. Well, I do think there is a direct relationship to being a part of the body and community that does make one mm. one's sanctification process. Thus, you're right. You're yeah, right. <laughs> I was just pushing what you said to out yeah. of balance. Yeah, by itself for fun. <laughs> and if you're not aware, Tyson that that was Tyson. Yeah, Tyson likes to do that, which we like. I promise we like it. Um, <laughs> I'm not trying to convince myself. I'm actually just saying that we do. I do actually like this. I do like Tyson. He's fine. <laughs> That's a funny moment. Um, okay, so um, let's begin to wrap up since we have already taken most of the time. Um, verse 10 says, by this. Because of this thing, by seeing this thing, it is evident that the children of God or the children of the devil can be distinguished, right? Whoever doesn't practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. What's interesting there is the emphasis at the end of verse 10 doesn't say anything about the child of God. It says... Whoever doesn't practice is not born of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So not practicing righteousness 
and not loving brother is not born of God. Why doesn't it talk about the other side of it there? What do you mean? What's the other side? The other side is he could have said, whoever does practice righteousness is of God. And whoever does love his brother is of God. He says, by this it's evident who are the children and who are the children of God and the devil. And then it says, who doesn't practice and who doesn't love? Hmm. I think probably in part, if I don't know this for sure, but if I'm just to take a, a stab at it, I would say uh, the error is that there are people who are claiming to be um, those who are following, but not living a life that, de- that is demonstrative of the fact that they are born of God. Um, and so there and are just come off a number of verses talking about yeah, the people so who are not born of God. Going backwards, just contextually, uh-huh. uh, the previous section there, uh, verse 18 of chapter 2, talks about the Antichrist. Um, and so the, he's been talking about people are going to come with this false message. Mm-hmm. And so one of the false messages that it would come would be similar to what you were saying, Tyson, is that, hey, your guilt's done, so just do whatever you want. Right. Um, you yeah. know, your guilt's which, taken care of. Which there, was a part of the Gnostic belief. Yeah, and there Not were lots of versions of that. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Not that that's what this really is. But. <laughs> Never mind. And it, so the, it was in, it was in the, the ether. I yeah. mean, those ideas were there, some. Yeah. But yeah, it's I mean, not the Paul formed, writes it in Romans, the you know, Romans, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Like it, the logical yeah. thought is going to be there even in the framing of the letter to, to the Romans. Um, and so I think the reason he writes it is to make very clear um, the, the false teaching that can quickly infect our minds. Um, and that. Yeah. And as a contrast to all that stuff at the beginning that we put a pretty serious focus on, which is children of God. Mm-hmm. You are this. You, you know that Christ was righteous. Uh, you've seen people who practice righteousness, and that's evidence of them being born of him. I'm thinking of like verses 28 and 9 that we said at the beginning. You yourself have seen, 3-1, how much the Father loves you. Um, how amazing that is. That's so great. And that's true. Beloved, that's you. And contrast it at the end with the opposite of that, Mm -hmm. which is the, which is going on in their context and saying, see, you're not the real deal. See, you're not the real deal. Um, it's a, it's its own strange doubling down and emphasis on assurance to make clearer even than we've been able to suss out and parse out here because we didn't spend a lot of time in the middle. But yeah. to make even clearer the difference between born of God and not. And the two things are righteousness and love. Mm-hmm. Practicing righteousness and loving. Yes. And, and let's end with this question. Um, we've talked about love. We've just kind of said it. We've alluded to, you know, grace-based love comes from God. It has to be that for it to be love. Um, what do we mean by love here? What is love? Oh, man. Baby, don't hurt me. What is love? <laughs> <laughs> the I would say, I mean, the love the Father has given to us is the first uh, phrase there. Um, so what love has the father given to us? It is, um, it is, he has given us his love through Christ. Um, and so it's defined in the way that, uh, he has initiated a relationship with us through Christ, um, would be the way that we would define that love. He goes on, he's going to go on to define what that is, but Jesus, of course, in, uh, his teaching defines that, um, as well in the way that we love the law defines what love is for us in the old testament um what that looks like what does it mean to love your brother mm-hmm. um yeah so everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness and you know they, they're without the law of god mm-hmm. and so he's he was calling them earlier to 
practice these these laws that the scriptures have revealed um, in the in the context of Christian mm-hmm. uh, of Christ. Just to support what you said, yeah, we yeah. we see what law is um, based on what the we see what love is based on the law of God. Um, the word forgiven there in three one. I was thinking about this as you were talking about. See what kind of love the Father has given. The word given uh, can also be translated as like granted, um, which I think is essentially what we're saying about what love is. I mean, you said it. I'm just trying to yeah put a, a finer point on it that you don't get it right. You can't get the love of God in the sense that we cannot do what He's done through Christ to make us righteous. So it's a granted thing that comes from him that's grace. And so if love's going to actually be real love, it can't be the opposite of that. I think so often we think about love as just this um, gentle affection, um, this favoring toward an emotional uh, thing of I, I just have nice warm feelings about you, yeah, um, and that we we so often think about even in the way that we think about oh God you know He just um, had this affection towards us and so He wanted to have a relationship with us, but there's uh, scripturally as a, as Which a is whole true love much more points towards a, a covenant and a commitment of um, right treatment right interaction right relationship. Uh, and so I think about as we do this in weddings, often we talk about how the love relationship of a husband and wife points to the relationship of Christ and his church. And, and so we talk, mm-hmm. think about that as a, a covenantal commitment of, um, of right behavior, righteousness, um, even when there's not the floaty emotions uh, or feelings of, right. that there's more to it. Uh, Willing to self-sacrifice when when you don't want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when the emotions and feelings aren't there, but you do it because it's good and right and helpful for the other person in that sacrificial sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. We'll probably continue to define love as we make our way through this section. Oh, yes, that's the entire uh, series idea. Yeah. Oh, good. I thought we were going to have to nail it right now. <laughs> no, because we certainly <laughs> We just did, did Tyson. <laughs> oh, uh, I mean, yeah. no, we didn't. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.